One of the more advanced issues you'll have to deal with as an integration architect and developer is around multi-threading. If you're unaware of the threading strategy of MuleSoft, your projects are susceptible to unintentional issues where you could incorrectly change the data you're moving around. In this video, I'm going to show you a very common situation where not paying attention to your threading strategy while building a scheduled job can compromise your data integrity. Then we're going to implement the fix while learning about MuleSoft's thread pools. By the end of this video, you'll have a greater understanding of thread management inside Mule, so you won't have any multi-threading issues in your projects. So we're inside AnyPoint Studio version 6.4.4 and we're using the Mule Runtime 3.9.0 Enterprise Edition. What we're going to simulate today is a scheduled job. This is a common task I've had to do quite often. And the premises around them are quite the same. We have a quart scheduler, which will trigger the job at a certain frequency. And then we have a process that will follow that will get run after every time the time scheduler kicks off. So the business use case we're going to solve today is that we are pulling from a source system and inserting it into a target system. There are many different flavors on this depending on the type of source system and how you're retrieving data from it. And same way on the outbound is how you're modifying the target system. The source system could be an HTTP endpoint where you're pulling data from. And the target system could be a database which you're inserting records into. But this is a very common integration pattern. So I have the skeleton here of a really scaled down version of what typically happens. So I have a quartz scheduler which triggers every 10 seconds. So I have 10 seconds here and it repeats endlessly, minus one here. And then I have a transform message just so I can keep a transaction ID. Um, you'll see about this later. Right now I'm using the time the job gets triggered at as the transaction ID. And then a log that just prints out the job has been triggered. And then I call a flow, which I call orchestration. And in between the start message, log message, and an end log message is typically where you'd add your logic. And that would involve, as the example I said before, calling an HTTP endpoint for any records that have changed between a certain dates or a watermark, and then say inserting into a database. So let's go ahead and run this simple flow. And it's ran once already. So the quartz job is for every 10 seconds. So there it is just checked off again. Let me just stop this. So I have three log messages. The first one job has been triggered, which is this kickoff log. The second one is the start and the flow. And then I have 10 seconds, but typically in most applications, it wouldn't be 10 seconds. It would be something longer, potentially um, on every hour, every 20 minutes, or maybe even once a day. And usually this type of job wouldn't cause any problems. However, I've ran into the case actually more than once where this type of architecture could get you in trouble. A typical problem that I've seen a few times is that we build the application based on the current requirements. For example, if our requirements were to pull the HTTP endpoint every 10 seconds and update the results into the database, and at the time of building this application, our average number of records that we would fetch from the API would say 10. So we build it with 10 second intervals and it runs in the first one or two seconds of the job and then we don't have any problems. So we deploy this and then we walk away. However, in my case, we actually had a good problem where the line of business of this source system actually picked up. So the number of records increased exponentially. It wasn't a problem initially because we went from average 10 records pulling from the API at once to 20 to 30, but then we started getting into the hundreds and we found that this application was taking longer and longer to run the orchestration flow. And this wasn't a problem until what happened is that the orchestration flow was now taking longer than the interval trigger time of our job. So let's go ahead and simulate that. So what we have here is our quartz job that triggers every 10 seconds. So let's say, for example, our orchestration flow, 
that's in milliseconds, takes 12 seconds. And this is an expression transformer. You could also use Groovy if you wanted to simulate this thread.sleep. So let's go ahead and save this and run it again. So our job's triggered, we're at the start of the orchestration flow, and then we have that sleep for 12 seconds. And in the real world, we wouldn't be sleeping for 12 seconds. What we'd be doing is saying, calling the API running into the database. But in our simulation, what's happening is that we are now dealing with large amount of records. So it just takes longer to go from one connector to the next. So as you can see, what happened here is that our first job triggered, and then we started the application flow. And then actually, this is a new transaction ID. So what happened is a new trigger happened when we hadn't completed the job from the previous one. So this is the second time it got triggered, and then it went to start that, and then you can see this 51. Then we finished the first job. And this wouldn't be a problem if, say, you're just doing reads. However, what could happen is if you're updating a database, this finish orchestration job could be writing data to the database after job two. So you could be mixing up record orders. You could be overwriting. For example, say um, an order came in and then there's quickly an update order. The update order would come in first before the new order. So we'll have inconsistent data and potentially some errors being thrown as well. Before I show you the fix, I want you to understand what is happening in the background behind the scenes to cause this issue. This is the MULE 3 documentation about tuning performance, but it's really just talking about thread pools. And this image right here is what I want to bring your attention to. In MULE 3, there's three different types of thread pools. There's the receiver thread pool, the flow thread pool, and the dispatcher thread pool. For this video, I just want to talk about the receiver thread pool because that is what's involved in our issue. So you'll see here that the inbound endpoint, which in our case you can see on the left side of this dotted line, is a quartz scheduler. So this quartz scheduler has its own thread pool called a receiver pad pool. And if I scroll up here, I just want to read out a few things for you. If you are doing async processing, which we are doing by default, we haven't changed the processing strategy, the receiver thread is used only to place the message on a staged event driven architecture, CETA queue, at which point the message is transferred to a flow thread and the receiver thread is released back into the receiver thread pool so it can carry on another message. So that's very important. So what's essentially telling us is that Behind this quartz, there's a thread pool. I'm not sure exactly how many are. Let's just say there's five by default. I, I haven't set it. Uh, it's one execution per thread. So it'll wake up a thread. It'll wake up every 10 seconds. It'll pick a thread up to, to send a message to the flow. And it says here, so it sends the message to the flow thread, which in our image is the second set here. So the message processors. So it's throwing it to the message processors, and then the thread doesn't continue through. What it does is the receiving thread goes back into the quartz pool and waits for the job to be triggered again. So you have two different types of threads. So you have the receiver thread, which all it does is pass it along and then goes back and waits for another trigger. And then you have the flow threads, which are executing the rest of the statement. So what's happening is the thread is getting returned after the first call. And then the court schedule wakes up again, gets picked from the pool, and then passes it again. However, what's happening is that the previous thread is still in the middle of orchestration. So you have the second thread catching up and accessing a few components inside here before the second one be able to get further. And you could have some really overlap. And because I've hard-coded this to 12 seconds, in a real-life situation, it's not really accurate because each thread could take different times going through your processing. So for example, if one of your requests failed and you had a retry, it could set you back a few seconds so that the second thread could catch up. 
or if say one of the pulls had a lot more records than the second one, the first thread would be slower with the extra memory to complete as the second one who has less records would pass through quickly. So there is a high possibility that the second thread will catch up to the first one. So how are we gonna fix it? Well, the first thing we need to do is to limit the size of this receiver thread pool. Even if we take one of the five threads and hold it for the whole execution, there'll be a second thread that could be used on the next trigger of this job. The way to limit the receiver thread pool to one isn't available on the UI. So what you have to do is use a little bit of code. And let me show you how to do that. So you click into your quartz and it has to be done with a connector configuration. So let's create a new one, press OK, and then we're gonna switch over the code. So we're gonna take our quartz connector configuration that was just generated with that plus arrow, and we're gonna expand it, and we're gonna do control spacebar on a Windows job to see what type of elements we can add. And you'll see here that there's a receiver threading profile, and this is where you manage the properties of the receiving thread pool. And as an FYI, there is a dispatcher thread profile element as well. So from our example, if you'll notice, there's also a dispatcher thread pool on outbound connectors. I'm not gonna get into this video, but if you're interested, it kind of works the same way as the inbound endpoint, but you can read this page for more details on that. But we're gonna go back to our receiving thread pool, and then we're gonna do the context hints so that we can get our attributes and we're going to choose max threads alive and the attribute description you'll see is the maximum number of threads that will be used so if we put a one here that will say only allow this receiving thread pool on this quartz configuration to have one thread maximum so the idea is that when one thread is executing through this flow when the job triggers again, there won't be another thread available to run the second job until the first one is returned. So we'll go ahead and run this. Our job has been triggered. 23 seconds. And it's triggered again. Okay, let's see what happens. So the 23 second job was triggered 23 second job started the orchestration flow, which is the start log. But then we still had the issue where this next job being triggered, that 32 seconds started up ahead of time. Let's go back to our documentation and what we were reading before. We do have asynchronous processing because by default it's asynchronous. So the message is transferred to a flow thread and then the receiver is released back. Okay, so the thread that kicked us off, as soon as it got to here, was released. That means that there was one thread available in the receiving pool, the only one that we have, to handle the second time this was triggered. So there's only one, but it's still being returned back into the pool as soon as it passes to the transform message. So what we want to do is keep that thread all the way through and don't allow it to be available until it finishes with this end log message. Now I'm gonna bring you back to this diagram and show you these arrows down here. So we're using by default and all mule flows when you drag them to the canvas, asynchronous flow. So you can see that the thread pool, receiver thread pool is only going to the message processor and then the execution is being passed to the flow thread pool until it hits the outbound endpoint and it's passed at dispatch or thread pool. However, we look up here, we'll see that if the job was a synchronized flow, then there's no passing of the execution across thread pools. It's just the same thread executing the whole way through. And let's see the description of that in the documentation here. If you're using a synchronized processing, the same thread is used to carry the message all the way through Mule, which is exactly what we want. We want our receiving thread pool, which only has a count of one, to go all the way through our execution and then come back to pick up the next trigger. So we need to make our job from the default asynchronous to synchronous. And we can do that easily by clicking on the flow and going to process strategy and changing it to synchronous. Now let's run that. 
the first job triggered is at 46 seconds. And now we're waiting for the orchestration flow to complete. Let me just run this one more time and then I'll stop it. So what happened here is the 46 second one job was triggered, orchestration started, and then orchestration finished. And then you can see that the second job was started up. So we have no longer the intertwining of messages between scheduled jobs, which is exactly what we want. So we don't have any unintentional consequences with the data we're moving around in our orchestration flow. One thing I do want to point out is if you notice the time the jobs were triggered, the quartz is scheduled to trigger every 10 seconds. But because the thread wasn't available at 10 seconds, it was actually, it actually got triggered 12 seconds later. So that's one thing you do want to pay attention to is that if you have multiple jobs, that the second job doesn't matter on when it's triggered, it's actually going to be queued up and held until the first job completes. So if you have a history of jobs going over, you could get a very big backlog of jobs waiting to complete. So in that case, you may have to adjust the interval of when your jobs get triggered, or if that's not possible for the business, you may have to find ways to get through your orchestration quicker. Well, that's all I have for this tutorial. Hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know down in the comments if you have any questions or if you enjoy this tutorial because it is a pretty technical. We are dealing more with integration architecting of MuleSoft flows. So it might be a little advanced for some people just starting out. So let me know if you prefer the beginner or advanced topics or it doesn't matter and you just prefer as many videos as possible. Well, thanks for watching and see you next time. Peace.